Hello, everybody. My name is Justin Beckner. I'm here from ultimateguitar.com, and I am here with the great John Oates. John, thanks you so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks, man. Nice to meet you. All right. First of all, are you familiar with Ultimate Guitar? Are you? Do you use tabs at all? I, I don't. I'm not a tab guy. I'm I'm a I'm a real chord guy. But uh, <laughs> but um, no no. I am I am I I, I frequently or infrequently. Uh, check it out because every once in a while I'm looking for changes and things like that, making sure I'm playing the right stuff. You know, um, you know, it's a it's a good resource for sure. We wanted to talk to you about the new single, "Too Late to Break Your Fall." I got a chance to check it out. What a great song! It's got a little bit of old school swing. It's kind of. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know where the heck I came up with this. Um, I know where the what the I know the meaning behind the song. I know where the lyrics and the, the idea for the the message came from, uh, which came from working with someone who I will not I will remain nameless. Uh, but it was one, you know, I, I think we all know people who um, kind of sometimes can't get out of their own way, and um, you know, they they ask for advice, but they really aren't listening. <laughs> And uh, it was kind of one of those moments, you know, and I just thought every time uh, I try to help it doesn't seem to work, you know, and um, but, you know, but they kept coming back and asking me for advice and help. And I'm thinking, well, why are you asking me for help if you really don't want it, you know? And so that's the gist of the song. And musically, the music sounds great. The guitars specifically sound fantastic. Uh, oh, did nice. you record the guitars on this? Well, there's there's two guitar players on this. It's me and Shane Terrio. And I don't know if you know Shane, but Shane's a monster. I'm playing, actually, I'm playing this guitar right here, uh, which is badass, I have to say. It's a, a 66 ES-125 with a P90. And um, this is the guitar I'm playing on that track. Um, you know, it was like, you know. You know. Sounds a little better when it's plugged in, but but that's uh, that's the gist of the song, you know. Um, I was actually finger picking on this one, um, you know. I, I played it with uh, I played it finger style, you know. So that was the, that was the vibe on this song. Um, yeah, I had a great band. I mean, that band is uh, the band on that track is um, is uh, uh, Greg Morrow on drums is one of my favorite Nashville drummers. Um, Steve Mackey on bass, who plays with me live. Uh, Shane Terry who played electric. Um, can't remember who played keyboards on that one. Um, but a guy named a great saxophone player who here again in Nashville I use a Jim Oak played sax on that. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, that song is funny. I recorded that song um, 12 years ago, maybe. Um, and I did it kind of acoustically. I did it with like an acoustic, almost like a Delta blues swing. And it was pretty good. Um, but then I just thought I'd revisit it. And the, the song sounded like it needed to be a little more sophisticated. So I went with a full rhythm section, electric guitar, you know, all that sort of thing. That's a bit of a departure in the tonally uh from your 58 strat that i know was uh, a guitar that you have used in the past uh in mm -hmm. recording well my 58 strat is my go-to electric guitar um uh, you know i've been playing that guitar since 1974 or 73 um and uh yeah it, it's a, it's an amazing guitar and i i kind of try to retire it from touring um and i keep bringing it back because i can't replace it uh but um I actually just got a new guitar. So I'm going to guitar nerd out a little bit. And this is guitar I'm playing now. And it is really amazing. This is a James Trussart. I don't know if you know him. He makes the Steelcaster and a bunch of those ones. This is a chambered Tele. So it's hollowed out. It's chambered. This is metal. You know, his metal, metal thing that he likes. It's got his, one of his custom humbuckers, two Tele pickups. And um, it's, uh, it's a really cool guitar. Uh, and one of the reasons, um, one of the reasons uh, I, was gra I gravitated toward it, just, I just got it just recently, is because the 58 Strat that you mentioned is technically chambered. And the, and the reason I say that is because over the years, the pickguard was removed um, when originally when the Strat pickup setup was taken out and replaced with humbuckers. 
the guy who did it routed it out on the inside with a Dremel, and he literally just tore it apart. And so there's a giant hole under here. In, I'm talking about the 58 Strat. And so in a sense, it's part of the reason that 58 Strat sounds the way it does. And so when I was talking to James and he told me about a chambered te a Strat, I went, whoa, wait a minute. It's kind of like what I like because of, you know, and believe it or not, this thing really, it kind of sounds like the 58 Strat. It's got a much better a whammy bar. It stays in tune better. Um, but anyway, so that so I recently got that guitar just because I thought, well, you know what? That's a it's a it might be a replacement for for that fifty eight Strat, and I think it is. You know, it's pretty cool. I haven't haven't played it live yet, but I will. How often does a song start with a guitar? Uh, is that where songwriting starts for you, or is it a melody? Is it piano? Where do you gravitate towards when you're starting that songwriting process? I mean, I I, I definitely gravitate. I mean, it's it's always guitar first. Uh, I can, I'm a rudimentary keyboard player. Yeah, you know, they, they, they do two different things. You know, if I play something on a keyboard, rhythmically, I'm definitely in a different world. Um, whereas the guitar, uh, I, tend, I tend to be more percussive and more uh, rhythmic on the guitar. because, And it's, it has to do with my ability to play, really, um, because I'm just not a very good keyboard player. But uh, no, you know, it could, be a, it could be a lyric. It could be a, an emotional feeling. It could be a title. Uh, it could be, it could be a, a chord progression, uh, it could be a drum groove, you know, it could be almost anything. I, I record on GarageBand. Um, I'm a GarageBand guy. <laughs> I love GarageBand. I, you know, a lot of people bust on me about it, but, um, it is, uh, it's the quickest way to a song. That's what I call it. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very, very good at it. I've been, I've been on GarageBand since it ever, since it was invented, uh, since, since Mac offered it. Um, and I've actually been involved with some uh, uh, some improvements and some uh, technical uh, tweaks on GarageBand as well. And sometimes I'll pull up a sample and I'll add a GarageBand. You know, it's just some some standard thing that might be a drum groove or a beat. You know, and a lot of times the song doesn't end up with that same sample or that same beat, but it was a place to get started. You know, it was like a, a kick in the ass to kind of get get the song going. And the other thing I found that's really good with with my songwriting is like when I when I flesh out a song and I've written something, I flesh it out at home uh, on a home demo on, on GarageBand. When I take it into the studio, because I love live players and I love to play with live players in the studio. Um, but I take it in, I take that, that home demo in, and all of a sudden, you know, all, already, you know, the guys I'm working with, rather than me trying to explain things to them, I just say, here, look, this is what I did. It's kind of the vibe I'm looking for. And then, then we then we make it real and we make it live and we, we get the input of the real players. But but there's already, you know, instead of starting way down here, we're starting up here in terms of the, the development of the arrangement, the song, the vibe, the, you know, the style. Um, so it really saves a lot of time. Um, and I'm not a slave to it. You know, I don't say, oh, it's got to sound like the demo. You know, that's the, that's the worst thing you can do. Um, you know, when you get, you know, demo love, you know, when you fall in love with your demo and you can't beat it. Um, so I try not to, to, to get, to take it that far, but, but, uh, some of the songs that I've, um, not, not on, on this most recent one, cause that was totally live. Um, I just played it. I played the guitar for the guys and I said, here's, here's the song. Let's go. But, uh, on some of the other ones, I don't know if you heard the earlier ones like disconnected and pushing a rock. Uh, there's a lot of my, uh, garage band, uh, tracks on those songs my original garage band tracks because it was during the pandemic that I wrote those. And um, because I had a lot of time on my hands, I just, I just kept recording and I, I did a more refined, complicated recording on those songs. So when I brought those into the studio, we, we transferred a lot of my original garage band stems to Pro Tools. And um, there's a lot of original uh, demo uh, tracks on, on those songs. That's awesome to hear. I love it because I, I use it as well. Uh, I would imagine you're oh, not good. using the stock plugins. Um, yeah, I am. I don't. I, I I've downloaded a few plugins, but not many. I went to Logic, you know, and I thought, oh yeah, it's like you know, GarageBand is like Logic Light. And I went to Logic and I said, why? I said, why do I need all this stuff? I don't need it. I mean, I'm I'm a shitty engineer, so why bother? And you've been re releasing these singles about once a month. Uh, do you feel that's kind of the way forward for the industry these days with streaming, how it is? 
yeah, I mean, I'm catching up. You know, I'm I'm old school catching up kind of guy. Uh, it was it's it's really a, it was an experiment for me. Um, I've never this is the first time I've ever done a recording that had no physical component. Um, so uh, I thought, you know, let me try it and see what happens. Um, because you know, I, in general, I mean, I have an older audience. I think the, at least the Hall and Oates fans, the hardcore Hall and Oates fans, are are by and large an older audience. There's plenty of young ones, right? But uh, I wasn't sure whether they're going to, you know, want to stream and want to download, you know. And and there's been a little bit of pushback from some of the older older fans who said, you know, how come you're not putting out a CD or how come you're not putting out vinyl or whatever. So yeah, a little bit of that. But by and large, people have been liking it. Um, and so it was a good way for me to dip my toes in the water of the new reality. But now that I'm, I've done it, um, and I have, I still have a backlog of songs that I haven't released. I've got some songs from soundtrack for a movie that just got, came out, uh, and I was trying to figure out what to do. So I think this fall, what I may do is put out an album, uh, a physical album. Maybe it might be vinyl or CD, whatever it might be. Uh, it'll be digital as well, of course. But um, and I think what I'll do is I'll put out all the songs that I released digitally, these initial five or six, whatever it was, plus all the backlog of songs, and um, you know, probably be a double album because there's a lot of material. But I'll do that in the fall, I think. Yeah. What else do you have on the docket for 2023? Is is this going to kind of continue releasing singles up to the release of that double album? Do you have some other projects in the works? I think I'm going to stop after this one for a little bit because I'm, I've got tons of live shows. Um, starting in July, I'm super busy. I'm um, going to go out on the road. Um, first thing I'm doing July 14th, I'm playing a festival uh, with kind of the Good Road Band. It's the, the Good Road Band is all my guys from Nashville. Um, a, little, a few different pl different guys uh, plugging and playing, but uh, I haven't played a band show in a long, long time. I've been doing acoustic uh, singer-songwriter type shows with, with Guthrie Trap on a second guitar and or a percussionist. Um, I did Europe last year with Beth Hart with just me and a percussionist, and I really enjoyed that because it was very freeing I could do pretty much whatever I wanted with a great percussionist. Um, so I'm doing that here in the States. A couple shows with Guthrie. We're doing the Newport Folk Festival in late July uh, with Guthrie. And then doing a bunch of shows without him uh, with the percussionist. And uh, he's a guy I've been playing with uh, for what, 20, over 20 years. Um, so that's fun because, um, you know, I just get to play different stuff. And, you know, as I said, with a great percussionist, you know, you can really just anything you want um, when you don't have to worry about people knowing the changes and everything like that take requests you know so it was much more kind of a loosey-goosey uh, freewheeling kind of kind of type show where I tell a lot of stories and things like that so I'll be doing that through July into August uh, into September and uh, yeah there's a lot of shows uh, I'm all over the place so if you go on the website you'll see um, you'll see where you know where the tour is is there a song in your career that you're most proud of writing? Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, I'll always go back to the very beginning. She's Gone is probably the, the benchmark song for Daryl and I, uh, because for a number of reasons. One, it was the first one that really made a mark in the world that people listened to. Um, it put us on the map, so to speak. And it's one of those songs that just has a timeless quality. Um and it has to do, you know, I, I like to think of that song as a, um, as the perfect storm. Uh, first of all, we wrote a really good song. Uh, but then when we got in the studio with the, uh, we, we were working with Arif Martin, who, uh, one of the greatest producers of all time. And uh, he surrounded us with some of the greatest studio musicians in, uh, in New York at that moment in 1973. And, you know, Bernard Purdy on drums. And he just, you know, just the cream of the crop. And so with with the with the with the with the core of a good song and then these amazing musicians and then with a reef's production sensibilities and his amazing string arrangement that he wrote, um, it was really it just everything was perfect. It's just one of those moments where it all just went like this. I'm really proud of uh, of the of especially pushing a rock and disconnected. Uh, those two songs really they came together during the pandemic when I wasn't sure what was going to happen. And it was a, they were a labor of love where I felt like I really could, 
I could step back from like traveling. I could step back from a lot of things that were swirling around and just focus on the, on those songs and making them as good as I could. I think disconnected is really the, uh, you know, to me is the ultimate expression of the pandemic because, you know, it's a simple title, obviously, but in that, sim in that one word, it, it seems to sum up everything that I was feeling. And, uh, and from what I understand from other people, they agree. Uh, you know, it was, it, we were all disconnected spiritually, physically, emotionally, uh, psychologically, you know. So it was just one of those things where that word popped out and I thought, okay, it's, it seems almost too good to be true, too simple to be perfect, but it was perfect. You know? And, uh, and I mean, you've navigated a lot of perils through the history of music and over several decades being in the music industry. Uh, a lot of our readers or listeners are uh, aspiring musicians. Do you have some advice to those budding musicians on navigating the business end of the music business? <laughs> yeah. Um, as, a, as, a, as a famous actor once said, get a good lawyer. <laughs> um, I say that tongue in cheek, but I actually say it in truth. Um, it, it actually does help. Um, well, you know, I, one thing I will say is that the younger generation, the newer generation of musicians are certainly a lot more savvy on the, on the, you know, the pitfalls and the, uh, ins and outs of, of how the music business works, which is great. Um, I, on the other hand, uh, made huge mistakes by just not paying enough attention to the business side of things. Um, and, you know, trusting that certain people would take care of that for me on my behalf, allowing people to uh, to run your business without any uh, checks and balances can be a very dangerous thing. I think uh, I think the thing to do is, you know, as a, as a young musician, when it comes to the business, you know, be as knowledgeable as you can, um, especially in in um, in the field of publishing, which is a very very complex and Byzantine um, thing. I'd say, you know, just be, be as not, I'm, you know, the kids are coming out of places like uh, Belmont and, you know, Juilliard, not Juilliard so much, but uh, of course, Juilliard, but, uh, you know, uh, up in Boston, Berkeley, you know, they, they take courses in, in the business side of things, which is fantastic. So they come out with a much more uh, comprehensive knowledge of really what they're getting into. It doesn't mean you can't take advantage of it because you will. Um, you have to almost accept that. At this stage of your career, how do you define success as a musician? And is it the same way that you defined success earlier on in your career? I think, uh, I don't know, I, I think the needle of, of the bar or the bar of success moves. Uh, all, it's always different. You know, when you're first starting out, you know, I'll just speak for myself. When I was first starting out, you know, the, the, the whole the holy grail of success was an album deal back in the early days. You know, if you got an album deal, it meant a record, a major record label, with a major record label, which was the only record labels there were, uh, you know, if they signed you, that meant, you know, it was kind of a stamp of, of approval of, of uh, that you had, you know, made it to some extent. So that was the first, you know, bar. Um, that then, you know, of course, the bar keeps moving. You know, then are you going to have a hit? You know, so you're going to have your first hit. You have your second hit. You're gonna, are you going to be able to stay in the music business? So are you going to keep your contract? Or are you going to fold? You know, so the bar just constantly moves. You know, and then on the on the side of uh, you know on, on the live performance side, you know, you're always setting the bar. You know, uh, getting a band together, playing playing better, learning your craft, playing your instrument better, singing better, writing a better song. Um, and you know, then you're playing live, and you're, where are you playing? Oh, you're gonna play the club. You know, which club are you playing? You're playing the hot club. And, uh, oh yeah, I'm gonna play that club. Now we're moving up to a theater. Hey, oh, we're in a theater. Hey, how about uh, how about Madison Square Garden? You know, hey, now we're headlining Live Aid. Ooh. You know, so I mean, the bar just keeps moving. Do you feel there's any mountains left for you to climb musically? Uh, are there any uh, goals that you you hope to reach yet? Not really. Um, I, I don't have any, any like ultimate goal. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've done so much. Um, what I want to do is um, my goal now is to stay healthy enough because I'm old. You know, I mean, I'm up there. Um, I want to stay healthy enough to be able to enjoy the fruits of my labor, so to speak. You know, I have um, I have some issues with my fingers now. 
which never happened before. You know, I'm constantly stretching my fingers; they're getting stiff. And so, you know, the little things like that are creeping up on me. And you know, I, I can kind of see the horizon in a sense, um, but I don't want to accept it. So I'm doing everything I can to keep it <laughs> keep it out there <laughs> in the distance. You know. So, I mean, as you said, you're very focused on your solo work right now. You got big plans with that. Uh, are there plans for another Hall & Oates record anytime oh, in the future? I doubt it. I mean, I, I'd never say never to anything, but I doubt it. I think Daryl and I have moved beyond it. You know, I think we've, I, I really do. I, the future of Hall & Oates is in its past. Um, we have a body of work that is so big and so deep. And it's never even been tapped, to be honest with you, because the hits, uh, the hits overshadow the big hits, which is great. Believe me, I'm very appreciative of it. But those big hits overshadow the body of work that we've done. We have 300 songs um, who the, and the general, only the hardcore Hall & Oates fans know about. Um, but I, I think that one thing I'm very proud of in the Hall & Oates history is that um, we put as much time and care into every song on every album. Um, the, the, the songs that became hits, they became hits after the fact. They weren't like, oh, this is Maneater. We're going we're gonna to spend more time on Maneater because we know it's going to be a big, big record. So we'll just, you know, and the rest of them, we'll just knock them out. Far be it from the truth. Uh, we've never done that. Um, I think that's, that's something to be proud of. Um, there's so much music in that history. Yeah, it's a it's a fifty year history. I mean, that's kind of crazy when you think about it. So yeah, I mean, who knows? You know, documentary films, Broadway musicals. There's there's so many ways to take advantage of the great the great uh, legacy of Hall and Oates that I I personally am not interested in trying to do more. For the ultimate guitar community, uh, a lot of us are, you know, uh, a lot of the, our readers are younger kids who maybe just bought their first guitar. For that kid who just bought his first guitar uh, and is trying to write original songs, do you have any advice for them as far as songwriting or musicianship? Study the masters. Study the people you think are the people you like. Uh, figure out why you like them. What is it about their music that reaches you, that touches you? What is it about their music that inspires you to want to play? Um, if you kind of analyze and break apart the music of the people you respect, you'll get an insight into who they are and how they think musically. And that insight, if you're creative, can be a stepping stone to unlock the creativity in yourself that's that's really the key you know you you know when I, I, that's what i did that's what so many people do what i mean is and that's i hear people doing it today i hear people you know i hear modern pop you know using uh there's cer certain hall and oats type uh you know um references um when i was you know when i was growing up i wanted to i wanted to sing and play like curtis mayfield and doc watson and Mississippi John Hurt. So I learned all their songs. I learned their songs note for note, tried to emulate them as best I could. And, and in doing so, now I use, now I have this frame of reference. I have a musical frame of reference that I can tap back into. And then I, t I tweak it and turn it into something else. But in the back of my mind, a lot of times, uh, I think I'm playing Curse Mayfield. <laughs> you know, that's what I hear in my head, but it doesn't come out like that. Um, but it's, you know, I, I say that's that's the way to do it, you know. Well, I thank you for that advice, and I thank you for all the music you put out in the world. I'm excited yeah. for the, the next crop of music that you're going to bring out into the world. Um, <laughs> yeah. The solo stuff is really great. Thank you Thanks. so much for putting it out. Well, I'm having a good time. So when you have a good time and you're making records, it usually translates. Something about the vibe always translates through the, through the speakers. Well, I'm going to let you get back to recording because uh, okay. we're anxious to hear what you're coming up with. All right. Well, it's, it's boring right now, but it might be good later on. <laughs>